Yeah, 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 I remember. Do you remember? Okay, I'll just I wonder what the teacher's going to teach on tonight. Revelations. Yeah, I heard. <laughs> Excuse me. Hi, lady. You're happy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so good to see you. Oh, it's so good to see you. I love you. I'm you're so glad you're here. You're <laughs> oh, my mom was your savior. I know. I'm so glad. You asked me about Kim and her husband. Well, you'll enjoy it tonight. I know. You will. Oh, my God. I know. I know. I know. I know. Yeah, 
That's, that's before you went into the scalp. Yeah. Are you, you going to be with us regular? Yes. Uh, Hopefully. Yeah. You know, the cubs are looking better than ever. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Good as good. You know, when you go, you know, 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 you
He hears the birds squawking for a few minutes, but all of a sudden the parrot is quiet. So the man opens the freezer door. The parrot walks out. He looks at him very contritely. He says, I apologize for offending you. And I humbly ask your forgiveness. The man says, well, thank you. I, I forgive you. Then the parrot said, if you don't mind my asking, what did the chicken do? <laughs> Sometimes it just takes a little help to get your attention to me. So, Miss Linda, please come on up. crossed his owner as well. Uh, you know, so my goodness. Hi everybody, I'm glad you're here tonight. Um, this is the so what segment, which means that we've gotten all of this word, we've gotten all this information. So what? Are you sewing it? Are you doing anything with it? What are you doing? I had a great, <clears throat> a great week this week. Um, just getting to see people that, you know, God's he just brings people in your path sometimes, but sometimes, as Wanda knows, you have those dry weeks and then you just gotta press in in prayer. But the one thing that I have, and actually, where is she? There she is, Sandy handed this to me just two minutes ago. And as I started to read it, I realized even though I, I'm not gonna necessarily read this word for word, this is what's really been on my heart this week. Seeing so much happening in the world my husband's going to talk about what he experienced in Israel. Um, he just got back last Thursday night and um, had been there for two weeks for the, you've heard of the Feast of Tabernacles. Um, some people call it Sukkot. That's the Hebrew word for it. But he was there for that, plus the blood moons and all the other stuff that was going on. It was just amazing. But if you watch the news, secular or Christian news, you're hearing what's going on over there. And he wants to, he's going to tell you a little bit about that. But this, this specifically in Sandia, I'll read it, but I'm not going to, I, I, anyway. But it has to do with what's going on in these, in every place else except the U.S. yet. And so many homes of so many Christians are being infiltrated. People are being told, I just heard this on the news, um, man is leaving his, his home in Syria because he's afraid and his son is in the car with him and they're leaving and one of, one of the terrorists comes up to his car, blocks his car, holds a gun up to him and says, your car or your son? Well, what are you gonna do? Of course, you're gonna hand over the keys. And the guy took the car, saved their lives, but this is what's going on all over the world. You know, there was a old saying that uh, and, and it's a famous quote, but, and I'm going to botch it, but you'll get the gist of it, and I know you've mostly heard it. When they came for the, this person, I didn't do anything because I wasn't one of them. I, when they came for these people, I didn't do anything because I wasn't one of them. And when they came for the Christians, there was nobody else left, <laughs> and I ended up, you know, at their, at, suffering at their hands. The problem is, we are the layer to see a church. And it's happening all over the world. All of the um, civilized countries. How's that? The civilized countries. I heard this yesterday. <coughs> Ooh, that's an interesting <coughs> Sounds like a bird sitting right over there. I heard, I heard this yesterday. Um, we keep teaching in an Acts, to an Acts 2 church in an Acts 2 church kind of way. But the church today is an Acts 17 church. And basically, um, our country these days, we don't have a foundation of Christ. We don't have a foundation necessarily of right or wrong anymore. And we just go and start telling people about Christ as if they already know. And they don't. They're completely, completely oblivious and unaware. So as you have opportunity, especially, what big holiday is coming up? I'm sure you've seen it around your, your community. I know one of my neighbors not only has, um, yeah, not only has uh, um, spider webs all over the place, but body parts, or it looks like body parts, laying on the lawn, 
that have what looks like blood on them. So I'm thinking, what a great opportunity to share Christ and life with them. So anybody have any any um, any stories this week? Wanda, is it a good one? Oh, I just about yes. Just People have been praying this week for you, then. No, that, not that kind of. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Um, I wanna I wanna read something to you. I want you to hear this. Really, really listen to this. Difficulty is actually the atmosphere surrounding a miracle or a miracle in its initial stage, yet, it, yet if it is to be a great miracle, the surrounding condition will not be simply a difficulty, but an utter impossibility. Mm -hmm. And it is the clinging hand of his child that makes a desperate situation for the light to God. Mm -hmm. Now, just in case anybody in here don't believe in miracles anymore, <laughs> God still performs miracles, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you what right now. My car was due this year for small. I have a 96 Buick Century. And I started praying in July. I said, Lord, I need to pass small. That gives me two more years. I can't afford a new car, et cetera, et cetera. So I guess the devil said, okay, I'm going to jump in there. I'm going I'm to cause you some fear. Mm -hmm. One of my life scriptures is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Mm -hmm. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. So my car has been running raggedy for a couple of months. I mean, it's just like, <laughs> get to a stop sign and it, uh, a stoplight or something cuts off. Or one day it just cut off in the middle of the intersection and I didn't even, I hadn't even stopped. So I said, oh Lord. So then the day that I got my registration that required me to get a small, my check engine light came on. Or service your engine soon. So I started praying, I said, Lord, my daughter and I have put a new fuel filter. We put some gas treatments in the thing. I said, I cannot afford to have this car fixed. I cannot afford any expense, so I need you to, to be the master mechanic for me. I need you to take care of this car. So last Wednesday night, when I came to Bible study, when I went home, I noticed that the car wasn't chugging, chugging. <laughs> and I'm like, wow. And when I pulled up in the driveway, now that check engine light had been on for couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. And I know I said, ooh, that light's gone. And when I got out the car, the Holy Spirit spoke to me just as clear as a bell. He said, take that car tomorrow and have it small. Mm -hmm. So I did that. I went up there. That car went through small so fast that it just we was in and out of there. And, that's <laughs> and I was leaving. The guy came up to me. He said, ooh, your car runs so well. <laughs> She said, what did you do to make that check engine like go out? I said, I ain't do nothing, honey. I said, but pray. So it's just, it's like, I, have, I wrote this in my journal when I says, trying to explain God's grace that, co that covers us in every situation and circumstance. It's like trying to hold on to the smoke or the wind. But like the smoke and the wind, God makes his presence known. Amen. So if you don't believe in miracles, honey, that was it. Oh, and by the way, the next day, Friday, when I went to Bible study, I went to another Bible study on Friday. It's about to chugga chugga chugga. <laughs> chugga chugga chugga. No prayer. No, there you I, go. All right, I didn't worry about it. But God was there. Here. <laughs> there you go. There you go. It's it's hearing and obeying. That's right. We, we can all hear and find all kinds of excuses why not, mm -hmm. but hear and obey. That's yes? Right. Amen. Well, I moved here about um, five years ago, and my next door neighbor and a friend across the street came over, and they wanted to take me to dinner to welcome me to the neighborhood. I said, okay, I went out to dinner with them. And then um, they invited um, me. That was Okay, we'll help them. So um, I got acquainted. They, they were friends. It was a lady and a man. And so it was my neighbor across the street. And so um, he passed by me one day and he said, My father, Miss Barbara, he said, My father died. Mm -hmm. And I said, How may I pray for you? And I, I prayed. I said, May I pray for you? So he's Catholic. So I said, May I pray for you? 
And he said yes. And so I prayed for him. And so uh, then he said to me, would you like to come to the service? And anybody that knows me, unless the Lord gives me a go-ahead sign, I won't do it, right? So I said, Lord, what are you saying? And the Lord said, yes. So I went to the Catholic service, and um, I stayed after it. I talked to his mom and prayed for her. And um, God, you know, God is so good. He's so merciful. He's so gracious. Yes. And he, he opens doors that no man could shut. I just have to say that because this wanted to pray for me on Sunday. This is part of that. But anyway, long story made short. Um, you know, I was really thanking the Lord for the opportunity because I was able to stay for the meal. Oh, I had to go on the bus. It was really a really hot day. Oh. And I went on the bus and everything. And so um, this man knew that I didn't have transportation. So he said, don't worry, Miss Barbara. I'm going to see that you get home. And he says, I want you to take some of this food with you and leave. And so anyway, long story made short, um, his mom, the next Christmas, told him to invite me to go with him to a, a Christmas program in heaven. So I went and enjoyed it with her. And she just, I enjoyed her, and she enjoyed me, and I enjoyed all of them. Well, Sunday, um, I had gone down to the altar and I asked Ms. Wanda to pray for me that the Lord would give me a word and season and that I would be obedient and do what he tells me to do and not look back. It was based on the, past, the word the pastor had given us on Sunday before about the neighbor, mm -hmm. about you know, our neighbors. And the other word is not looking back, but press forward. And so on Sunday I was standing at the gate waiting for my friend to pick me up for church. And this man across the street, that the same man, he said, Miss Barbara, my mom died. Mm -hmm. And he was he was still in motion, like driving. I said, wait a minute, Steve, wait a minute. And so I just kind of prayed short because he was in a hurry. Mm -hmm. And so I just prayed a short <laughs> prayer for him and everything. And he said, Thank you so much, and he left. So I went to the grocery store early. I always go early in the morning because it's really hot. Mm -hmm. To the grocery store early Monday morning. And, you know, I was just just thinking and everything, praying, walking back in the store. And I made my lunch and everything. And about 11.30, the Lord said to me, you need to get a card. You need to go get, go get a card for Steve and write the prayer because he will not remember how you prayed for him to write the prayer. Mm -hmm. So... I walked to the store <laughs> and I said, Lord, I know you always, keep, when you tell me to do something, you always keep me cool. So I had my umbrella. It was like 11.30 Monday. And I went in the store and I said, Lord, just give me the right card. And, you know, I knew he was going to give me space to write. So I got a card for him and I, I ran home. <laughs> I practically ran home <laughs> because I knew that I was supposed to get this card to this man right away because of the way the Lord had, had orchestrated things. And so I wrote the card, and then I started looking for his phone number because I wanted to call him. And so I called him, and I said, Steve, I said, um, I have a card for you. Would you like me to leave it on the porch for you, or do you um, want me to, um, you know, can you come to the floor and get it? He said, I'm on my way out, but just leave it on the porch for me. And he said, Miss Barbara, I have to tell you something. He said, my mom said, she always talked about you, and she said, you're the sweetest person that she's ever known, and I had to tell you that. He said, we love you so much, and we appreciate you. And I was thinking, God, you're so good, because he's opening the doors that no man can shut. And people just remember that when the Lord tells you to do something, we all have our own gifts. When he tells you to do something, just be obedient, because we don't know Whose heart you know, the Lord is setting for us to walk? That's right. Acts of kindness. It's it's important, and those things will stay with him. Those those are seeds. So, yes, absolutely amazing.
Thank you very much. And I'm sorry for your loss. She sounded like she be, had become a friend. That's difficult. Well, no, she had not become a friend, but um, she was a very good neighbor. So, um, as we were talking about the things that are going on in the world, Scott, um, can you come up and give us a little bit of encouragement what's going on in the Holy Land? What did you see? What's happening? And uh, this is my husband's <coughs> pastor, Scott Miller. <laughs> Hello. You know, it's, it's, it's neat to talk about things like Israel, but, you know, when I hear the individual stories of what God is doing in the lives of Christians, on a regular day-to-day -day basis, those are the most powerful stories. Because that is the reality of the Holy Spirit working in the lives of the yeah. believer. Take care of his children. So, um, so yeah, this was my third trip to Israel. Um, every time I go to new experience, um, you know, when you, when you go to the place where this book is written about, you, you, you bring a higher level of reality to your faith. Now, God gave us, uh, you know, he, he, he didn't want us to be ignorant about times and seasons and this, that, and the other. And he gave us this thing called, uh, it's, it's like a, if you want to know what time of the day it is, you look at your, your watch. If you want to know where we're at in God's timetable, you look at Israel. That's our watch. You don't look at anything else in the world. There's The Bible says there's going to be wars and rumors of wars all over the world, but you really got to look at Israel. Israel tells the time. So uh, so this time, uh, <coughs> being my third time, I didn't go on a tour. Um, I like to go on my own and and uh, rent a car and learn how to drive in other countries. I really enjoy doing those things. But um, I'm just going to give you a few highlights because there's a special time of the year in Israel that I went it's called Sukkot. It's the Feast of Tabernacles. And it's an interesting time of the year, but it was a little bit more special this time because we had this thing called the Blood Moon going on. Mm -hmm. And that was, uh, it's basically a lunar eclipse. And it was really neat because the night it happened, um, you know, it started like at three in the morning, but it was in full blown eclipse by 547. And it was neat because I was on the rooftop in Jerusalem and it's very dark and you can see the moon and it was just the atmosphere was just incredible you could hear you know the blowing of the shofars right you could hear those all over the city but right about the time that it eclipsed um, the Muslim call to prayers started at the same time so it was almost like this battle was going on for who was going to be in charge of the airways but it was really neat because you could see it very clearly and it was low on the horizon, so it was very large, very large. Yeah. So why is this a special time of the year? Well, Jews are commanded, male Jews are commanded three times a year to go to Jerusalem. And Sukkot is one of those times. So you've got religious Jews from all over the world that want to be at Jerusalem, especially at the Wailing Wall. Does everybody understand what the Wailing Wall is? You'll see those pictures online. Well, and then during that week of Sukkot, which is when I was there, um, they have what's called the blessing of the priests. So they've got a big stage set up and all these religious Jews are there. And what they do is, is the rabbis of Israel, the chief rabbis of Israel, they have this big event where they're going to pray over and bless the the Kohen, the, 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 the priests of, of Israel. So if you go online and, and see this picture, there's got to be at least 20,000 people in this very small area. I've never been in such a packed crowd before. Um, you, you almost couldn't move. It was so packed with people. Um, but the significance of it is, is that not only do, are the Jews showing up, but Christians from all over the world are showing up for this. And that's what the Jews don't understand. <laughs> Why are Christians showing up from nations all over the world at this time to support Israel and to love the Jewish people? 
I really believe that this is going to be part of how God begins to evangelize the Jewish people. Because prior to this, the Jews never had any support from, you know, you look at World War II and most Jews will say, well, where was anybody? Nobody was there to help us. So now you've got uh, pretty much everywhere I went, I, I saw and heard people from all over the world. I was on the, uh, the uh, Mount of Olives. And there's a, there's a hotel up there called the Seven Arches. And it was packed with people from China. And they're just, you know, they're walking around waving these flags and they're having worship ceremonies and they're doing a lot of things that the Jew is trying to figure out why. Why are they loving us? Why are they supporting us, right? There's a scripture in the Bible where it talks about that it's through jealousy that God is going to, to call the Jewish people into relationship with him. So you've got all these Gentiles, all these Christians, calling out the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and loving Israel, and it's causing a phenomenon to take place. Because again, the Jewish people have never, in, never experienced this before. So when you look at all these things taking place, and you look at the fact that Israel is this time clock, and you begin to see these things, you begin to say, okay, either there's this voice whispering in everybody's ear all over the world, like some marketing piece telling everybody to do this all at once, or we're seeing the signs of the times. Take, for instance, this. I, met, I got to meet with the Temp Temple Institute people. Now, the Temple Mount Institute people are the Jewish people that believe they are called to build the third temple. They believe that's their entire calling in life. They have built everything. They have the, 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 all the articles for the sacrifices, the water basins. They, they showed us the uh, priest garments. So right now, for the Levites who are going to actually serve in the temple when they get to build the temple, they have 400 of these men all over the world that have already ordered their custom-made Levite garments to serve in the temple. What's interesting about that is and that for some reason, and I guess it's part of their rules, but th their garment has to fit perfectly. They can't just throw on a garment. Their garment has to fit perfectly. So these 400 men, these 400 Jewish Levites all over the world have already ordered their garments. They've already been custom made. They have these garments. They're just waiting for the building to be built. So the interesting thing about that is, is you can either say, you know, it, it's almost like somebody's writing a perfect script. And they don't even realize that they're fulfilling prophecy right in front of our eyes. So we got to meet with the Temple Mount Institute people. They, the menorah is ready. All the things for the sacrifices are ready. It's truly amazing because a Christian would look at this and go, this makes sense. It says this in the New Testament that these things are going to happen. They don't get it. They just feel like they're answering their call. So all throughout Israel, um, I... Uh, so a little geography here. I started out in the south, down by the Dead Sea. And in that same area in the Dead Sea, now the Dead Sea is seven times the salt content of the ocean, and it has 30 minerals in the water. That's why people who have all kinds of skin ailments and muscle ailments go to the Dead Sea, and they get healed of all these different problems because there's so many wonderful things in there. Now, the Dead Sea makes you so buoyant that you can literally lay back on top of the water and fall asleep and you won't go under the water. It actually forces you up out of the water. It's pretty amazing. It's a weird feeling. It's a weird feeling because when you're in the water and you're kind of just uh, treading water, you're almost flipping back because it's constantly trying to flip the bottom part of your body up out of the water. <laughs> Um, in that same area is En Gedi. En Gedi is the place where David hid out in the wilderness with his men while he was being chased by Saul. One of my favorite places in all of Israel. I love it. I go there. You have to hike up the hills. And once you get up to where the cave is at, where David hid out, 
there's a beautiful uh, waterfall that comes down the mountain, which also was a part of God bringing refreshing to these guys when they're in the wilderness. And then, of course, there's Masada. Masada is a place where uh, King Herod built. It was a fortress. The Jews hid up on top of the mountain. And uh, they actually, instead of giving up to the Romans, they actually all committed suicide. It's a very tragic story. It took place after, um, I forget what, you know, A.D. it was or whatever, but there were, you can still see the Roman fortresses around Masada, and they were there to, to get the Jews. So, lots of great experiences, but the most important thing I'd like to, to bring to you guys tonight here is, is that um, in my second week, I'm sitting up in Haifa, that's way in the north, and I'm reading about, here I am just a few miles away from the Syrian border, and the whole Russian army is, is up there, right? So Putin's come in with their air force and their army and everything, and I'm thinking about the fact that all the right players are coming to the table right now. All the right people are coming into the region. So again, this is either an amazing script that's just coincidentally coming together, or we're actually seeing what is in the Bible unfold right, right in front of our eyes. Scott, yes. Also, in that same context, what was going on that same day as the high priest was blessing all the other priests? What was, what else was happening in the world that day? At the UN? Oh, yeah, that was kind of interesting. Um, the, uh, it gets a little bit political here, but the UN that day actually decided that they would raise the Palestinian flag in front of the UN. Now, keep in mind, Palestine's not a state, but it's the first time ever that they've raised a non-state flag in front of the UN. And that was followed by the Vatican actually even endorsing that. So it's kind of interesting, you know, again, you would and look at this the stuff and you... the time that the priests are being Right, blessed. that the priests are being, that the priests are being blessed. Um, you know, and it's, and believe me, it's safe to be in Israel. Everywhere you go, you see young Israelis that are in the army, they all have to serve. Um, they have their machine guns. Very safe place. <laughs> so, so it's an exciting time because we're seeing, to think about, this is a nation that God brought about 70 years ago that wasn't in existence for 2,000 years, even brought their language back. It's, it's the equivalent of being on the beach with a handful of sand, throwing it into the wind, coming back 2,000 later, and all those pieces come back into your hand. And only the Lord could do that. So be encouraged that God put you on this earth during this time. It's not, it's not a mistake. He could have put you on this earth at any time, but with the way the Lord talks to me about this time in the earth, it's like the ninth inning. But God chose you to be here during the ninth inning. So you have a part and a purpose to play. So I can tell you lots more stories about Israel, but I wanna, I have a couple of things I'd like to give away tonight, but I'm gonna do it based on whoever can answer my questions about Israel. <laughs> so these, I brought a bunch of these back. I always like to bring gifts back. This is Bethlehem olive wood. And I got these in Jerusalem and I always write the date on the bottom of it. So I'm gonna ask just a couple of geography questions about Israel. <laughs> so I'm gonna start out with an easy one. Who can tell me where Tiberius is. Just raise your hand. Where's Tiberius? On the Sea of Galilee. Actually, it is the Sea of Galilee, right? It's called the Galilee. There you go. Perfect. It's 
part of our apologetics. Do we really know what we're talking about, right? You know? Okay, here's another one. So tell me, in what city in Israel are the tombs of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Bashir. Where? Bashir. Yeah. No. Starts with an H. Hi. No. It's kind of in that area. What's that? There you go. Hebron. That's a winner. Ding, 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 ding. What's that? Is that Hebron? Oh, she's already got a couple. <laughs> okay, one more, guys. Okay, let me think about. Maybe I should get a little bit easier. <laughs> okay. Um, so this is good. What is the name from the Bible story? What is the name of the house that is in Jaffa? There's a guy that lived in Jaffa that was a very important story in the New Testament. There you go. Woo. And, and it's interesting because what did she if you, say? Simon the Tanner. That, oh, yes. It's interesting because if you go to Jaffa, it, you'll find his house. And and it's, you know, but it, it used to be a uh, like a tourist attraction for Christians, but the Arabs didn't, they, they don't want Christians to come to tourist attractions. So they make it very difficult, very difficult. I'll give you one more story because I, I would talk a lot with locals. So you realize the West Bank, what's, what's, the, what's the most important city in the West Bank? No, in the West Bank. Bethlehem, okay? So if you talk to Arab Christians, that live in the West Bank, it wasn't until a few years ago when the Jews gave up authority of the West Bank over to the Arabs. And again, not being political, but I'm, trying, I'm going to share with you some stories that you won't hear on the news. So when the Jews were in charge of the West Bank, um, Christians could, could, they could operate as Christians. Uh, uh, the West Bank was clean. People obeyed the law. And Christians could have a nativity scene in Bethlehem. Once the Jews stepped out and let the Muslims, or the Arabs, take control of the West Bank, Christians are now persecuted in the West Bank. They're not allowed to have nativity scenes. Nobody obeys the law. So, so the point I'm trying to make here is, is, is not a political one. It's one of the fact that the Jewish people, whether you're Muslim or Arab or Jew or not, they support, they, they, they really want to create a safe environment for all those folks over there. And so everywhere you go in Israel, that's why you see people from, it, it doesn't matter who they are, they're coming from all over the world. As a matter of fact, people are coming to Israel at such a fast rate right now on worker visas. They are building, every city is building right now. They're building, they're going to have a train that goes all throughout the whole country. They're bringing in 32,000 Chinese construction workers because they don't have enough people for the jobs they have. That's how fast it's growing. But from a Christian perspective, I think that everybody should at least visit Israel once in their life and take what's on the pages and put some reality to it in their lives. So um, so God is moving, and you know, I, uh, John and I have talked a lot about it. What's the hook that's gonna bring down God out of the north? And then when I saw the Russians in Syria, I thought, wow, is this gonna happen while I'm here or what? <laughs> so anyways, God bless you guys. Thank you. And, uh, Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Wanda, Barbara. Thanks, Linda. Uh, I just think it was just important. I mean, you know, everybody gets to go to Israel, and so it's important to have some perspective. And 
Scott is uh, certainly uh, ready and able to properly uh, give his perspective. Um, so let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Revelation. We're going to start in, uh, in chapter 1, Lord willing, and, uh, and begin going through this book. Now, let me just tell you a few things while you're getting over there. Um, the book of Revelation, um, you could take this book and study it for the next year. Yeah. Every Wednesday night, and we probably uh, still not hit uh, most of the high spots. So what we're going to do is, is go through the book of Revelation, Lord willing, in, a, in about uh, eight or nine weeks. And so we're going to be going pretty quick. And uh, what I want to do is I want to give you an overview of what the book is trying to say. I want you to, I want you to take this in, in the context of what we've been studying with prophecy and see what God is doing now in this, this last book. And this book is then the, the culmination of those streams of prophecy that we're talking about. Remember, prophecy really deals with three different people groups. It deals with Israel, it deals with the nations, and it deals with the church. And in those three um, people groups, the book of Revelation uh, collides, if you will. Uh, what Jay Vernon McGee used to say, and I like this, is he, uh, he would liken it to uh, Grand Central Station. Some of us who are older we remember the trains and how everything would end up at, at one spot, you know, in the city. And this is what it's like. All these major streams of doctrine, all these major prophetic uh, utterances that are in the Bible, they all come and they, and they just uh, coalesce and they meet in the book of Revelation. Uh, it is a very important book. It is uh, obviously the last book in the New Testament. It has many parallels in it to the first book, and you would expect that. As I said before, the book of Revelation uh, has at least 500, and some say as many as 800 different references to the Old Testament. And so we need to understand our Old Testament. We'll talk about that as we go. But some of the things, just a few, just to kind of give you a, a feel for this, to whet your appetite. Um, the earth was created in Genesis 1-1. The earth is recreated in uh, Revelation 21-1. The sun is created to govern the day. In Revelation, there is no need for the sun because the Lord God is the light. Uh, darkness was created in Genesis. There is no darkness at all in the new Jerusalem. Sin entered in in Genesis 3. There is an end of sin in Revelation 21. There is a curse pronounced in Revelation or in Genesis 3. The curse is no more in Revelation 22. Death enters in Genesis 3. There is no more death in Revelation 21. Man is driven out of the Garden of Eden in Genesis. He is restored to the Garden and the City of God in Revelation. The Tree of Life is taken away and guarded so that man cannot get to it. The Tree of Life lines the main thoroughfares of the New Jerusalem. Sorrow and suffering enter in Genesis. There is no more sorrow in Revelation 22. And then finally, man's dominion is taken by Satan in Genesis. Satan's dominion is ended and given back to man in Revelation. So there's so many of these things that, that, uh, that are so uh, interesting about these, these uh, parallels in this book. Um, as we go through this, uh, I'm going to reference, in many cases, I'm going to reference the original language. I'm going to give you some of the Greek. It's in the notes. There's a reason for that. As we've talked about before, um, the uh, Bible that you have, if you read it in English, is an English translation of the original text. The, the original text uh, came and was written in Greek, Aramaic, and then in the Old Testament, also some Aramaic and some Hebrew, as well as uh, uh, Aramaic. So these things were all written into the Bible, and then they were translated into, into English. So those of you that, that, that have been taught that the uh, King James Version is the only translation of the Bible, and it's the one that Paul used, you are not correct. Um, it is an English translation. So in many cases, the, the, the Greek and the, the Hebrew, but the Greek here in Revelation, is going to help us a lot. It's going to help us to see not something new, but to see three-dimensionally. Sometimes we'll read something in English, but the Greek will bring in a new dimension to it, and we can see this, if you will, in three dimensions and get a good picture of exactly what's being said. So it's important. All right. Book of Revelation is divided into three parts. How do I know? Because Jesus said it is. 
if you have your book of Revelation, just look at chapter 1, and we'll start at the beginning, but just move back to, uh, to Revelation chapter 1, verse 19. This is what the Lord Jesus says to uh, John about this book. He, first of all, he commands him to write a book. This is not John's idea. He didn't leave and say, you know, this would be good for me to write down and send to my friends and we could give them party favors or, or whatever. This is a demand that Jesus made because he wants to know. He says in 19, write these things which you have seen, that's one, and the things which are, that's two, and the things which will be after this or take place after this. Three things. The book of Revelation is divinely broken up into three parts. And they are very logical they are incredibly elegant, and as we'll see as we go through this, they will make much more sense to you if you understand exactly what Jesus is trying to do. Three things, the things which you have seen. Now at this point is what we're going to read tonight. This is the vision of the risen Christ. What, what Jesus wants John to write is the things that he sees when he turns and sees this voice that's speaking with him. He wants him to be described. There's a reason for that, I'll get to it in a minute. He wants him to, to write down what he sees and then what Jesus tells him because this sets the foundation and the cornerstone, if you will, for the book. That's the things which are, the things that you've seen. The things which are will be the seven letters to seven churches, chapter 2 and 3. These are churches that existed when Jesus uh, was speaking to John in 95 AD. These churches existed in Asia Minor. They were churches that were doing, as we'll see as we go through them, many of the things which are described by Jesus. And there are a lot of nuances that Jesus brings into this to speak to these seven churches. But these are, again, uh, these seven churches don't represent just these seven places in Asia Minor in 95 AD. They represent the church as a whole. Seven is the number of completion, completeness, not perfection, completeness. It is the number of completeness, and these seven churches represent the entire church, then, now, and through history. They represent the entire church, and so what Jesus says to these seven churches is very, very important. As a matter of fact, um, the structure of the letters are all the same, with the exception of one switch and change in the last four, which we'll get to in a couple weeks. They're all the same. Jesus presents himself, and he will pick a title from the first chapter. Or two. He will present himself to the church. And then he will go about to give the church good news and bad news. What they need to do, what they've done right. And then he presents himself as the answer to what they need. Based on the description of the first chapter. It's, it's, it's really cool. And then what he says at the end is really important. He says, let he who has an ear to hear. Hear what the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is saying to the Churches, plural. Do you ever notice that? Do you know why he says that? Because he wants you to read all of them. Because we get instruction out of all of the churches. Now, you may, as we go through this, those of you that have studied this before, you will certainly go through and decide that you are in the church of Philadelphia. The, the, the church that uh, Jesus commands, the church that is being taken out uh, in the rapture, the church that, that does everything right. <laughs> and you may well be. But it's instructive to hear all of the other things, good, bad, and instruction in the other six churches because we need to see where we fit. The reality is not only are these pictures of the church as a whole in each of the different eras of the church, but it's also a picture of every individual Christian. You are somewhere in this, these seven letters. So these letters are written directly to you. It's good stuff. All right, so let's just go through. I'm going to read through chapter one. It's short. I'm going to read through it, and then we're going to back up and take a look at a few things here. Okay. Revelation chapter one, verse one. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant, John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ and to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep the things which are written in it for the time is near. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is, who was, who is to come, 
and from the seven spirits who were before the throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over all the kings of the earth, to him who loved us, who washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to God, his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, and they who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him, even so. Amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is, who was, who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, both your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom of patience of the Lord Jesus Christ, was on the island of Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands was one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his feet, girded about his chest with a golden band. His head and his hair were like white wool, and white as snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass and were refined in a fire, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was the, like the sun, shining, shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold... I'm alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and death. Write the things which you have seen and the things which are, the things which shall take place after these things. And the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand. And the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. Okay. Chapter one. That's all the weird. What he saw. It's interesting. Good stuff here. All right, well, let's pick it up and we'll just uh, make a couple of points as we go along. First of all, it says the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's what this is all about. The word here, you've heard this before, the Greek word for revelation here is apocalypsos. We've heard, heard about the apocalypse. In fact, everybody uses that term and they always use it wrong, yeah. at least in the world. Oh, well, it's going to be the Battle of Armageddon, it's the apocalypse. And, uh, and, and what, if you hear the secular, media and others talk about it, well, the apocalypse is when everything is destroyed and everything just is gone and the earth is a cinder and everybody's dead. They didn't get that from the Bible. They just made it up because they think that the apocalypse is something that, that, that is going to destroy the entire earth. Nothing could be farther from the truth. What we'll find out in the book of Revelation is God is reclaiming the earth. He is taking back the possession that he gave man dominion over, that Satan has taken over and ruled for at least 6,000 years, maybe more. And so God is taking it back. He is receiving back what is his, and he is giving it back to those to whom he had planned to give it in the first place. He is redeeming the earth, just like he will redeem your body. He is redeeming it, and he will make it new. We get into Revelation 21, 22. It says, Behold, I make all things new. He renews it all, and he makes it and puts it back into the condition that he expected it to have been in the first place. And as we'll find out for us, who are the church, what he has done is even better. Adam has nothing compared to what the church has. Adam was given fellowship with God and a planet to have dominion over. You are the bride of Christ. You are his closest love and you are an heir of all things. Everything that God owns, you are an heir to. Oh, that's good stuff. Only God could take the lousy situation that we put ourselves into and make it even better. He is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, including our redemption. This is a revelation, an unveiling of Jesus Christ. And, and the point here 
uh, is that what he's saying is he's unveiling this final plan. He is unveiling the capstone of God's plan of redemption. The book of Revelation is, in its final analysis, a book of redemption. God is finishing his work, as I pointed out. The things that, that started back in Genesis that, that were a curse to us, God is reversing and putting back in its rightful place. He is redeeming us. He's redeeming the earth. As we get into some of these plagues, uh, as we get into the seven uh, judgments of, of the, uh, the seals and the trumpets and the, uh, and the vials, we'll find out that God is dealing with the, the natural world and the spiritual world in the reverse order that he created it in Genesis. Mm -hmm. I'll point that out to you. It's exactly the reverse order. So he's, it's like he's rewinding the clock. He's saying, okay, all of these things happen in this order. I'm just going to roll it all back and make it better. He's dealing with it in the reverse order order. We will see sevens throughout this. I've given you just, this is a partial list. They've, they've found at least 150 different sevens, and there's a lot more because it just, it just goes on and on forever. The book of Revelation has what's called a heptatic structure. Again, theologians like words that nobody understands. It just means they, that, that there's a structure of sevens throughout this book. Sevens everywhere. And again, what it's saying through the Holy Spirit, what he's trying to say to us is that God is completing. He is finishing. He is making everything complete. And those things that, that, that have been lacking, he then will make complete. So seven is the complete work that God is doing. So this is a revelation that says that God gave to him. Does that bother you? Mm -hmm. God gave Jesus the revelation. Does that mean that Jesus didn't know it? And that this body gave it to him. No, of course he knew it. Does, did he have to know it? Did he have to know it? Yeah. How do we know that he knew it? Because he was uh, a Russian? Yeah. Uh, no, but... Okay. He says he's the Alpha and the Omega. Oh, okay, he's the Alpha and the Omega. Oh, he's the beginning and the end, yeah. Okay, so, yeah. probably knows, right? Okay. <laughs> Don't get hung up on this. There, there are a few things in here, and I'll point them out as we get to them, that are difficult. But let me, let me just tell you this. If you have a proper, and I mean this in all sincerity, if you have a proper understanding of Scripture, that is, you have taken a proper approach to it, that is, it's the Word of God, it's given by the Holy Spirit. There's nothing there that is not intended by the Holy Spirit to, to answer a question or to give information. If you have a good grasp on your Bible, Old Testament and New, and you approach this book with that understanding, these are not going to be hard. It's not going to be difficult. We get into problems with our translations, get into problems with our interpretations when we have an incomplete or a, or a distorted view of Scripture. That's why Paul said, study to show yourself approved, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, doing what? Rightly dividing the word of truth. This scripture is, there's a right way to divide it, and there's a wrong way to divide it. If you do it wrong, you're going to have a distorted view. If you do it right, things fall into place like a puzzle. And it, it just makes things a lot easier. Okay. What, it, what it's probably saying, and this is again uh, a bit of a controversy, but I don't think it's that unclear. He has simply given uh, this um, opportunity, he is directed by his father to make known to his servants what is about to happen. It is, a, uh, it, was, it, it is a command of his father. You say, well, does the father command Jesus? Yeah. He is, still, he is still servant to his father. He submits to his father. The Holy Spirit submits to Jesus and speaks only of Jesus. The father and the son submit to the Holy Spirit and say, you can do anything you want to us, but don't mess with him. And they all submit to each other. Right now, Jesus' position in heaven is to do one thing to intercede for you and to be the high priest. He is waiting for the time that his father is doing the work to bring all of his enemies and make them a footstool. So Jesus is performing his job as a high priest for us. The father is working all things to put everything under his feet. And then as Paul points out so elegantly in Ephesians, when they're all done, then everything is brought in and given to God and everything that is belongs to God. And it's, a, and it's a complete package. So it's, it's a great fact, including us. To show his servants the things which must shortly take place. I've noted in your, uh, in your uh, 
notes here that the word shortly does not mean necessarily that it's going to take place tomorrow. Remember, this is written in 95 AD. People have read this and said, well, then a lot of this stuff must have already taken place. And we get people called preterists. Preterists. It simply means that they believe that everything written in the book of Revelation took place back in the first century. I'm going to show you if you haven't already figured it out. There's so many ways that that can't be true. Um, that, that it's not even funny. But we'll get to it. I'll give you one example. There's lots. There, there are many things in the book of Revelation that could not have taken place 100 years ago. There are things in the book of Revelation that could only take place either now or in some time in the near future. Israel is one of those things. The temple has to be built. It has to be built in order for the abomination of desolation that we see take place to take place. And John hears, back in, in Revelation, uh, he will hear of this army that's coming against Antichrist from the rising sun, the kings of the east, literally the kings of the rising sun. And he says, I, I heard the number. And, you gotta, and John is astonished by this. You've got to realize, he says, and I heard the number. And it turned out to be, this is an army, a standing army coming against Antichrist from the east. This is where the Battle of Armageddon begins. Of 200 million men. 200 million men. When John was getting this letter of revelation, there was barely 200 million people on the face of the earth. And maybe not that many. And so when he says, I heard the number, he's making it clear to them. I heard the number. I couldn't believe it. And this has been some time ago, but back in the 70s, China was boasting that they could stand up an army of 200 million. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Shortly here is, is the same word that we get tachometer from. Anybody here got a lead foot? I know most of you women do. Okay. Uh, no, no, the women do. It's the women that are bad here. Okay. Lead foot. You know what the tachometer is? That's that thing that you keep up on the red line, you know, when you shift gears. That's for you women? Okay. The, the tachometer is measuring not, not time, but speed. That is the rotations of the engine. And that's what he's saying here. These things must take place in rapid succession. What he's saying is when these events begin to take place, they will happen rapidly. And we will see that. When we get through chapter 2 and 3, which is the church, when we get to chapter 4, everything from chapter 4 to chapter 19 all takes place in the space of seven years. It will start going. God is not going to mess around when he starts this program. It is going to culminate within seven years. Jesus is going to be on the throne, and it's going to be done. Seven years. Quick, rapid succession. So Jesus is saying he's given me this to tell what's going to take place shortly. And he has sent it and signified it. Don't pass up this word. Where are you? I'm in Revelation. I mean, yeah, I know. But I'm still in verse 1. Oh, okay. I know. We're almost, it's almost time to go, and I haven't got one verse done. Okay. It'll go quicker than this, I hope. Okay. I like to think of it like this, because this is more what it means. He says, I've taken this information, this revelation, that the Father directed me to give to you, and I have signified it. What does that mean? It simply means this. There are, there are things that happen in the book of Revelation that are actual events. These are not symbolic. These are actual events. And we'll see that, in fact, much of what we see in heaven are actual things. They're not just, you know, symbols. But... John is given symbolic visions. He's given the vision in chapter 12 of the woman with the, you know, the, the crown of 12 stars and sitting on the, the moon and all that kind of stuff. And he sees the red dragon. And he's got all these other visions that take place. What these are is God taking something, as we've said before, that are, it's very complex. And he is reducing it down to something we can understand. He did this in, in Daniel. Remember, we went through this. He took the, all the kingdoms of the world from Babylon through the final ten-toed kingdom, and he just signified it. He took it all and put it in this image that Nebuchadnezzar dreamed about. Head of gold, silver, brass, <coughs> and toes mixed with clay. He took all of that complex um, information and made it into a sign. 
He did the same thing to, uh, for Daniel in chapter 7 when he takes those same kingdoms and he shows Daniel what they look like from God's perspective and he turns them into beasts. We have the leopard, we have the bear, we have the nondescript beast, we have the lion. We have all of these things that he takes and then he, he reduces it to a sign. That's what Jesus is saying. Some of what we will see in the book of Revelation, God has taken and signified it. He has, he has reduced it to a sign so that we can understand what's going on. Here's why. Remember, here's our three players. These three, three things come together in the book of Revelation. The church, chapters 2 and 3, will be done. They are taken into heaven and become the bride. They don't leave the book of Revelation. We're going to see uh, this rejoicing, the, the, this, these doxologies that are sung in heaven. Power and honor and glory and praise be unto the Lamb forever and ever. We're going to see, there's going to be this constant, unbelievable praise and service. Guess who's doing that? Are. You are. We are. So what God is going to do now is he is going to take these three elements and we're going to see these in the book of Revelation almost like a shooting script in a movie. Um, any good movie that you, that you watch usually will have, it'll have flashbacks, you know, so you understand. It'll, it'll, it'll add details to the story, or if it's something that's very complex, you'll have this scene where you have these actors doing whatever, and then they'll switch to another scene where simultaneously somebody else may be doing something else, and then somebody else is doing something else, and so you, you're kind of seeing from these different perspectives all that's going on from these different perspectives so that you can get a good understanding of the whole thing. It's exactly what Revelation does. Exactly. He will show us, as we see in chapter 4, we'll walk into the throne room of heaven. We will see and hear and, and feel, hopefully, what the Holy Spirit is telling us about this, this place that we're going to see. And it will show us the perspective from heaven. And then we'll go and we'll be on the earth and we'll see plagues and things going on on the earth and the kingdom of the Antichrist, what's going on there, what he's doing, what, he's, what mischief he's getting into. And we'll see Israel, especially in chapter 12, who's being persecuted. They're being, they're being driven into the wilderness. But there's 144,000 of those Jews who are, who are preaching. And we see all of these different things that Israel is doing. So we've got the nation's antichrist and his kingdom. We have Israel and the things that are going on during this period. And we've got the church in heaven. Praising God. Amen. And that those who are coming out of the tribulation showing up. Revelation chapter 6 and others, people still coming up and joining that group in heaven. So he signifies this. We'll see that. Don't get freaked out by it. It's good. He signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ and to all things which he saw. Very important. Underline it. Star it. Highlight it. Make it your own. John saw these things. This is important because there are those, uh, I saw a movie not too long ago, well, it's been a long time, maybe 20, 30 years ago. There was a movie about the revelation of John, and the actor was, um, uh, what was his name? Maybe I guess it doesn't matter anyway, he was an English actor, and he, he was playing John. And uh, this whole reenactment of the, of the revelation was basically John falling into a trance and laying there and, you know, and uh, kind of jerking and, and, and doing things on the ground. And he, he's having like an epileptic fit. And when he, he gets up, you know, he's, oh, well, that was interesting. And he has to write it down. That is not what happened. <laughs> We're going to find out in a second that he was in the spirit on the Lord's Day. We'll talk about that when we get there. John says, I saw these things. He didn't have a vision of heaven. He was there. And when he says, I saw, the word there is, you know, Greek. There's a couple of different words for see. Uh, you'll see blef, blepho. This, this, is, this means just a physical, I saw something. This, 
goes much farther than that in Greek. It means that I saw it and I understood it. I saw it and I understood it. Jesus uses this example with, with Peter when he's washing feet in the upper room and Peter says, no, I can't wash my feet. You know the story. Jesus says, look, you don't know what I'm doing now, but you will know after this. And those two words, when he uses no, he's using Edo. You don't understand what I'm doing right now. But you will, Gnosko, you will know by experience later what this means. And so what John is saying in the context of this, this word here is he's saying, I saw it with my eyes, and I had understanding of what it meant. In other words, God gave him the understanding, and he was able to write it down. John saw this. He didn't dream it. He didn't hit his head on a rock. He didn't have some bad fish that day and end up with the revelation of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. Keep here means to guard. To guard. This book, um, we will find out at the end, this book also curses those who try and change it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's why I read it word for word. <laughs> okay, we're almost out of time. So let me just, uh, let me end there. And I apologize for that. But next week we will pick up, I will finish chapter one. Um, and then we'll move on and start getting into the churches. Okay, we'll go quicker. Uh, I'm going to give you these notes so that you can go through and, and check them. I'm not going to say everything that's in the notes because we just don't have time. But I've given them to you so that you can do your own, own study. Okay. Any questions, thoughts? Yes, sir. You and Pastor Scott pointed out that the temple has to be rebuilt yeah. for sacrifices. Yes. And uh, I know that the, all of the elements are there to, to build that, including uh, they have to have the ashes of the red heifer right. for some of their sacrifices. That's right, they do, but to and cleanse the temple. Perfect. And they've been raising those there for the last few years. Yeah. My question is, is there scripture that would tell us that that temple has to be built before the church is removed? No. No, and Pastor Scott, I know that I've heard this before. Did you guys talk about how quickly they could build a temple? Six months. <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's, they said they could do it in a, it's, it's a short period of time. Yeah. Um, one of the items that they did talk about, though, too, is the fact that they actually need the actual Ark of the Covenant mm -hmm. for this temple, and the Temple Mount Institute people believe they know exactly where it is. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, I've heard that. We'll we'll see how that how that turns out. I don't out. know where the scripture says it is. They know where the ark is. Before the throne. Well, there is an ark in heaven. We're going to see that. But you remember when when uh, Moses went up on the mountain? He was up there for forty days. He wasn't just again you know chasing lizards, you know, waiting, <laughs> and waiting for the Lord to show up. It says that. Uh, in Hebrews, that the Lord God showed him all the things that he needed to to do. That is the things he needed to make. That's the the, the tabernacle stuff, the candlestick, all that, that that whole thing. And where do you think the Book of Genesis came from? So these things are, are dictated. And the Book of Hebrews says that God told him, "See that you do all things as you saw them on the mount." He gave him instructions. So you can think of Moses coming down with the Ten Commandments, or 15 if you like, uh, you know, the, the Mel Brooks version. Uh, the Ten, <laughs> whoops, ten Commandments. Um, but he came down with that, and he came down with a, a, a roll of engineering drawings under his arm, too, because he built everything exactly. And if you read it carefully, he built what he saw, and he built a replica of what's in heaven. There's an altar in heaven. There's a temple in heaven. There's an ark in heaven. Is it the same one? Don't know. Do they have to have the ark? They'd like to have it. They don't know. But they can build one without it. And what I've heard, depending on who you ask, is you know they've got plans, uh, depending on where they can put it. They've got stones. They've got them cut. They've got, they've got everything ready to go. All they need to do is be told, go for it. So. Everything they, they have built, they have done so so they can quickly put it together. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 
So does the church have to be here? Does it have to be built before the church can leave? Absolutely not. There is nothing on the prophetic horizon that keeps the church from being raptured tonight. There's nothing left. There's just nothing left. In fact, everything is, is kind of pointing toward that because God is, is continuing to focus on Israel. That's what's happening, you know, with the, with the priests and with uh, Russia and with all the positioning and with, uh, with Iran getting the bomb and all of this stuff. You, you can tell that the focus is beginning to shift and it won't be long before the bride will be doing our work in heaven. Okay. It's good. All right, so next week, uh, read the rest of chapter one. Get chapter two and three. Just read them all. Uh, we'll get through chapter one next week, God willing, um, reasonably quickly. If you have questions, bring them. Yeah. <laughs> and look, if you're gone and I'm still here, we need to talk. Okay. Right. And then, yeah, and then we'll we'll uh, get through those, those pieces. Okay, let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight for your for your word. We thank you for our brothers and sisters. We thank you, as Pastor Scott said, we are here for such a time as this. Lord, you could have put us anywhere, but we are at the bottom of the ninth inning. And Father, we're here to do well. Help us to understand and to be the church that we might bless others and bring more with us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great week. Talk to you this now.